Well, hello. Uh, I'm Kyle Wiley Pickett. I am the music director and conductor for the Topeka Symphony. I'm actually sitting here in our Topeka Symphony office. You can see our old posters behind us of, of previous seasons. And here we are in one of the stranger seasons that we've ever tried to produce uh, during this time of COVID. Uh, but I am just thrilled that we are actually giving performances. Uh, we're one of the the minority uh, of orchestras in this country that is still performing right now. And, and we've taken uh, a lot of measures to make this as safe as possible for both our players and our guest artists and for our audience. And so uh, in addition, of course, to our live performances, we're also giving streamed performances right now. And uh, we're very excited to be doing that. So uh, with all of that said, this is uh, the second concert of the 75th anniversary season of the Topeka Symphony. And I am joined on this concert, and I'm very, very excited to be joined on this concert by a fantastic soloist, a pianist, a friend of mine, someone I've worked with before, and that is Sean Chen. And I'd like to welcome him to this virtual behind the baton broadcast. We've done this before in person. This is the first time we've done this uh, virtually, and uh, this will this will run as part of our Behind the Baton series through the uh, library here in Topeka. And then this will also run before our streamed broadcast of the concert. So Sean, welcome, welcome to our broadcast. Thanks for having me, really glad to be here. You know, um, I, I think I'll just start, I'll start with saying we are celebrating Beethoven this month. We are celebrating the 250th birthday of Beethoven, and uh, we know that we're about a month early that his birthday was in December. But you know, what's a month and over 250 years? Um, right. And and we're celebrating him with two monumental pieces of music. Um, with you, we're playing the third piano concerto, and then on the other half of the program, the symphony is playing Beethoven's fifth symphony. And since we've got you, let's. Let's focus for the moment on the on the concerto. And uh, but before we do that, actually, let's let's just check in. You and I work together. It's been a few years now, actually, since we. I want to say it's like maybe over five years at least. But <laughs> has it been that long? <laughs> I think so. It, I think so. It, it, it all sort of blurs together. I thought it was a couple of years ago. Maybe it's been five yeah. years. Uh, and uh, that was actually coming off of of. Um, of your being one of the winners of the Van Cliburn competition, and um, you were you were touring a lot and playing a lot that year. I think maybe we were one of the first orchestras that had you after the competition. Um, That's right. Yeah. So, what what have you been doing since uh, in the five years since we we performed together? So actually, at at that time, I was still living in the East Coast, uh, finishing up a degree at Yale School of Music. And I've since actually moved to the Midwest. I live in the same state you are in right now. I'm in Overland Park, Kansas, outside of Kansas City. Um, my wife plays in the Kansas City Symphony. So, um, and I teach at University of Missouri, Kansas City Conservatory. So yeah, I'm, I'm a local dude now. And um, I have a daughter and, you know, getting all familyed up and stuff. So uh, yeah. I, 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 guess it, I guess it has been a couple years since, uh, <laughs> Since we since we collaborated, um, well, well, tell me. I mean, you know, I I knew that you were here in in the area, and we haven't had a chance yet to to get together in person. Of course, in person is going to be delayed for right. Well, you and I will see each other on on Friday. Um, but uh, how have you enjoyed making your move to to the to the Midwest here and 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 living in the area? I mean, it's fantastic. Kansas City is such a, a, a awesome town. You know, before the everything was shut down, um, I was probably going to more concerts, live concerts, than I ever did when I was living in New York or, or Connecticut. Um, it just it, because it's so affordable, and all the you know the big shows that tour around the the country come through Kansas City, and you know I got to hear people like Manuel X and Nelson Frere, um, Philly Orchestra when they were here. Um, so it, it's been great. It's been great to be part of UMKC Conservatoire. We have a, a, a youngish, um, pretty much all new piano faculty as of uh, a few years ago. And um, we're really looking, you know, this year notwithstanding, uh, looking forward to developing and growing our, our department and kind of 
bringing, you know, UMKC Conservatory was for a long time in the past a destination for um, not just piano, uh, but 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 for for music, and you know, over the years it's sort of gotten gotten kind of complacent. Um, but we're we're trying to push the the hype back up and and really getting people excited about coming to UMKC. So so that's really exciting. Um, yeah, just I, I love it here. I love the food. I love. Uh, I, know, I grew up in a suburb outside of Los Angeles, and you know, I, I guess suburbs of of the United States are all pretty similar. So it's not a it's not a foreign feeling to me. But um, yeah, I, I love it here. That's great. That's great. Hey, um, tell tell me a little bit. You know, last time last time you and I worked together, right off of your 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 Clyburn experience, we talked a little bit about the the Van Clyburn and the competition, what it's mm -hmm. like to be to be doing competitions. Um, tell me a little bit about. Like what is what has your life been? How did your life change? What what was your what did your professional life become after that after that experience with with the Clyburn? Yeah, so the the reason why musicians do piano or do music competitions um, there are two reasons. One is a, a nice cash prize, obviously, but uh, we really do focus on the competitions that have a career package associated with it. So if you win. Or if you place, they are able to manage you for you know a certain number of years before the next competition rolls around. And the Van Climber is one of those competitions. Obviously, it's very difficult, and, and the level is very high. Um, but if you place, uh, even in the top, even in the finals, but especially in the top three, there is a uh, uh, they they manage you for the next three years. And you know that that's what we want as growing uh, as young musicians. You know, young relatively, and because you know money is nice but but you can spend the money but but a concert career at least a start of a concert career having those concerts lined up is, is very very important and then it's up to us to, to perform well and to you know be nice and uh good to work with so that that we get to we get asked back to back to various places and and to other places uh that the con conductors conduct that so like kind of like this so yeah, yeah of, it's it's like been it. life-changing you know to to win something like that I, mean, I think for any musician um it's it's great because you go from you know local con you know you might have some concerts from hometown or doing some other stuff in where you're going to, going to school from that to you know being booked all over the country if not all over the world um so that is a really big change and, and a very uh big boost for a career yeah so let's talk about it from uh, from a musical perspective, in addition to a career perspective, because um, we played, you and I did Tchaikovsky. We did the, the Tchaikovsky right. uh, piano concerto. Um, what did you What did you play in your in your finals at the Clyburn? So I played Rachmaninoff Third Piano Concerto as my big big piece, and then you have another one you have to play, which is a a classical piece. I did the Emperor Concerto Beethoven. Which is not really, a, I mean, yeah. it's, you know, borderline, borderline yeah. romantic. Um, yeah. So, but yes, those were the two concertos I did. And, um, and yeah, you know, the, the concertos are a big, big part of, a, as you know, of a performing, so a concertizing musician. And uh, not only that, but you, as a younger musician, you have to kind of learn stuff because uh, the programming for, for symphony orchestras is a lot more, um, there's a lot more factors to consider, right? And as a, right. a solo program, I can choose pretty much what I want to play. But when I play concertos with different symphonies, you guys have, you know, years of programming to to balance out. So, you know, as 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 a young musician, and and I I still consider absolutely you're a young musician. I still consider myself a young musician. I mean, in, in your first half of your career, in a lot of ways, you're a young musician. You know, and and then the second half of your career, you can kind of um, hone in you're, you're in the first half you're still learning so many pieces and and um, so I would be curious if you find that you are gravitating toward any particular repertoire any particular composers if you um, if you feel like certain things are a good fit for you and and I know that that can obviously change over time I mean we're we're, we're never going to right. be static but have, have you found that there's a, a repertoire that you especially feel good in I think that sort of has been sort of consistent since I was in school, actually, since I was younger. I, I really always loved Ravel and, uh, and a lot of the German composers, too, like Brahms 
and Beethoven and Bach. Um, I've been kind of, uh, since I graduated school on a, on a Nikolai Metner phase, he was a Russian composer who was friends with Rachmaninoff. Um, there's a lot of music there that's really, really interesting and accessible. Um, he has three concertos. You never hear them, um, and they're great pieces. Uh, just, just a little bit off the beaten path, but um, yeah, I, I enjoy playing those. I was for a while doing quite a bit of, well, not quite a bit, but but doing like ligety pieces and uh, you know, kind of doing some new music. Although recently, it's sort of, uh, I've been trying to actually fill some of the standard repertoire holes. Because when I was in school, I liked to explore and play different things. So I didn't really do a lot of the pieces that, you know, you would normally visit as a, as a student. Um, so I, I'm kind of going back and filling some of those spots. But, you know, I try to actually still put myself in uncomfortable situations. So if, if there is a composer that I don't feel 100%, um, you know, in tune with, I still try to force myself to learn some music and, and perform them and try to uh, understand that so that, um, you know, even if it's not 100% compatibility at this point, it, I, I get myself started on it. Uh, so are, are there certain, are there certain composers that, um, that feel better from a technical perspective? Uh, or is it about a musical perspective? What, what, what is it that attracts you to certain composers? Sure. So I think, you know, luckily technical things hasn't been a problem historically for me, so, so I'm, I'm lucky in that respect. I think it's more of a musical philosophy uh, thing. For for example, for a long time I avoided Schumann because I thought he was too crazy, but um, I, I did some research. I was listening to some um, of his biography and things, and I think I've started to get to to understand a little bit, at least you know, if I can't, even if I can't physically, I mean, uh, emotionally, 100% understand it. I think I, I get you know, his story, and, and it makes the music a lot more, um, mean, mean a lot more when you know, know those things. So, so there are certain composers that require that kind of knowledge. I think other composers where it doesn't really matter so much. I mean, you know, to play Bach, I don't think you need to understand, you know, it's nice to, to know his life and, and his, um, you know, who he wrote for and, and all that stuff. But, but I think his music just is pure, pure music, you know. So, um, and another, like Beethoven, I think we all grew up understanding his struggles and his life and, and his music. So, you know, I think there are certain composers that are easy, just, just kind of in the general uh, air more than, than others. Um, but, but I don't, you know. So, I, yeah. I was going to say, that, that, that makes for a perfect segue. Great, great uh, transition to, to talking about the, uh, the Beethoven concerto that we're going to play. And actually, um, when I talk about about why we are celebrating Beethoven this year, you know why the 250th anniversary is significant to us, uh, you know I always come back to the fact that he single-handedly took us from the classical era and classical aesthetic and dragged us into a, a romantic aesthetic. And and I think you touched on exactly why that is. I mean, when you think about Bach and even to an extent Mozart, Haydn. You know, and and you said, "Hey, what were you thinking about when you wrote that piece?" I I, I think I think they would say, "I was thinking about the harmony and the voice leading and the structure and and the uh, you know the the symmetry and so forth." And you and you might say to Beethoven, what "Are you thinking about?" And he could he 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 might say, "You know, I was thinking about the French Revolution and the way that I feel about the concept of liberty." And I mean, the the idea of putting their own emotional content sort of spilling the contents of their soul onto the page i mean that 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 started with beethoven in in large manner um yeah and so uh so and i think you're absolutely right about schumann too i mean you know some of these composers you know these later composers you do need to know to uh, to an extent what they were thinking about going through working through in their music and so so that takes us to beethoven and um you know, I think about Beethoven a lot as the symphonist. I imagine you think of him as the as a piano composer, right? I mean, with his sonatas and concertos. Uh, tell me about. I mean, what what does Beethoven mean to a pianist? Well, um, I, I happen to be a pianist who loves orchestral music, so I, I don't disagree with you that he's uh, a symphonist, and I, I think the two genres where I think he pushed the boundaries the most. I mean, he, you know. 
later on in his life, his spring quartets were amazing, and, and he really did a lot of uh, boundary pushing there. But throughout his whole life, uh, you can trace kind of how music develops in parallel with with kind of how he expanded the form in both the sonata form, the piano solo sonata form, and also the the symphony. Um, and I think it's there, there's something. I think this goes to what you're saying about this uh, about extra musical things, um, where it's sort of Beethoven against the world. He's trying to, you know, show the world what he's capable of, and, and he was a virtual pianist too. So I think in the sonatas and the piano concertos, he's pushing the boundaries for what a piano pianist, a touring pianist, can do. And um, there's also you know, you're talking about how, how Beethoven takes us from the classical to the romantic. I think what's interesting to remember is that the periods in classical music are always lagging behind the other arts. For example, romantic art and romantic literature started way before romantic music because, you know, we talk about uh, Goethe and, and his Sturm und Drang and things like that. And Beethoven was writing art songs based on Goethe's lyrics. So if, if Goethe is romantic, uh, a romantic author, then, you know, Beethoven was operating in that um, kind of mindset already, even though we don't consider most of Beethoven's music as romantic. So um, that's sort of, you know, kind of looking at it from uh, all different perspectives. I think uh, Beethoven really, you know, is, is in the, was in the prime spot in history to push a lot of these boundaries based on his kind of upbringing as a musician, as a performer, as well as his uh, vision as a composer well yeah and and you know we when, when you talk about the the why why did a compose what was the motivation for a composer to write a piece when you think about the concertos um they were vehicles for his own personal performance and uh he was showcasing his talent his technique his virtuosity and uh, you know we we think of him as a virtuoso performer we don't quite put him in the same realm is like say list uh, or, or Chopin right. um, okay. or even you know we talk about uh, Clara Schumann you know who are these but but that may be more because you know because he lost his hearing and really had to truncate his solo career I mean you would imagine that if he right. had kept his hearing he probably would have spent his whole life as a touring traveling performer as well as a composer uh, but he had to shift yeah. gears that way. And um, so as, as a pianist, what did what did Beethoven do to expand the vocabulary and virtuosity of what a what a pianist can do at the keyboard? So I think one of the biggest, uh, easiest things to notice, and it was spurred on also by the development of the piano itself, was how big his ranges are in both in, in dynamic in actual notes, you know, from the bottom of the keyboard to the top of the keyboard, um, at range of expression. I mean, he's able to play, you know, he, he's able to write things in double forte, triple forte, and also uh, pianissimo, triple, I don't know if he wrote triple piano, he might have written it once or twice, but, um, you know, I don't think Haydn ever wrote that kind of dynamic contrast and definitely not Mozart. And so, you know, he was able to, to include those and to write like that because, you know, of, of his status as a performer, but also because um, of, of the piano allowing him to do that. But yeah, he pushed that way. He pushed how long pieces could be. I mean, you know, I, as you, you know, as a conductor, those symphonies get longer and longer and longer. And, yeah. uh, you know, nobody before him did that. Nobody before him wrote developments which were twice as long as, you know, three times as long as the exposition recap or false developments at the end, you know, in the coda where you just, you're like, wait, I thought the piece was over and it's still going on. So yeah, as a, a I mean, I'm getting into the compositional expansion too, but uh, it also right. is very noticeable when you're a pianist. Well, and the, and the compositional expansion is, is critical in terms of understanding how we shift from the classical era and music to the romantic era. And I mean, for me, and I, I mean, I'm not unique. I think a lot of us peg that moment at the third Beethoven's third symphony at the Eroica and, and in 1803 when you know up till that time yeah, now to be fair Mozart wrote a couple of his last symphonies were were fairly long sure. compared yeah. to most of his early but a lot of the early symphonies 16 17 minutes long a lot of them are in right. 20 minutes you know maybe he stretches to 30 
And then the Eroica comes along and it's almost an hour long. I mean, it is a gigantic right. piece, as, as you mentioned. And, and really the concertos are too. I mean, again, if you look at the Mozart concertos, um, they're not, there's no slouch. I mean, those are no slouch as right. far as their difficulty and, and their structure and their length and their brilliance. But, you know, amplify it by at least a full 50%. Uh, just in terms of length and scope, is it um, okay? This is a question I haven't asked. Is it, do you find do you find certain pieces more tiring than other pieces? Is Beethoven uh, does he make demands on you that makes them more? I mean, obviously we you know you play Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky, and those are Brahms. I mean, for crying out loud, some of those you know Brahms second is just an enormous work. But I find um, Beethoven is. Um, is relentless. I mean, he really just, you, you don't get to relax ever, even in the slow sections of Beethoven. Yeah. I, I think as a younger pianist, because, you know, when, you, when you're growing up and when you're a talented, you know, kid, you, you play a lot of big stuff, right? You pick up, play a lot of Rachmaninoff, play a lot of Beethoven, Brahms, um, things like that, Prokofiev. So you're used to, I think, um, expect, expecting concertos to be kind of physically demanding. But I find yeah. playing Mozart is so mentally ta like taxing because it's not it's not as difficult. Sure, not as many notes, but every note matters and every note has to be phrased perfectly. And if you mess up a little bit, it's so much more audible. And you know, I think it's just it requires a lot more mental concentration. Whereas playing something like a Rachmaninoff concerto, by virtue of you having played it more and also you know, it, it's, you can dig into the piano more. You don't have to control in the same way. I think there's definitely yeah. something to be said about how tiring yeah. mentally it is to be elegant and phrase well and to, to you know, to do all that stuff. And, and early Beethoven, and Beethoven it can, be, can be similar too. Right. I was going to say Beethoven has the same, Beethoven requires a transparency that is so demanding of you all the time. And then you also... Yeah are expected to layer on uh, the dramatic emotional content that comes from the huge dynamic shifts and huge rain shifts right. and, and, you know, and his, uh, his melodic material as well. Um, so tell me, tell me on, on about this concerto. I mean, what is it? What do you love about the, the third? Well, when Beethoven writes in C minor, you, you have to listen. Uh, and, and this concerto definitely affected uh, a lot of, uh, other pieces that came after for, from other composers, um, and you know these the two pieces on this program are all in C minor. So there's something kind of uh, uh, many of you know the Pathetique Sonata, uh, piano sonata, and that's also in C minor. There's something kind of uh, weighty and dramatic about C minor for Beethoven, and I I love how that it is in this piece. Um, I think my my favorite movement is the third movement. Uh, I just love that rondo theme and how kind of it kind of reminds me a little bit of the Brahms first concerto last movement. There's a little bit of counterpoint in it. It sounds a little bit like Bach, a little bit. Um, and uh, and then finally that, that coda in the last movement where it goes into kind of this dance, this six eight dance, which Brahms also kind of utilizes a lot in his li later in his works. Um, it's just after you have all these C, ma C minor, you get the C major coda that's really ebullient and happy and, and um, sprightly and, and exciting. So. I really and of course like we've we've got the parallel it up. and we've got the parallel in in the fifth symphony which is it's it's stormy and c minor and dark at the beginning right. and then it ends with this large c major movement and you know sometimes in a lot of a lot of times i actually try to avoid programming two major works in the same key because it can be a lot of the same sound and tonalities but i think especially in this case with both the concerto and with the fifth symphony you have that emergence into the brightness of the major key. So there is there is such a sense of motion and travel and arrival that you get in both of these pieces that uh, that to me, it made sense that they that they were um, companion pieces on the program. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I think it works really well. And you get the nice middle movements for both of them that are, um, you know, Beethoven's really good at kind of cleansing the palettes in between. And he always goes into keys you don't expect. Um, in, in those middle movements. Yes. So, you, you know, just because the piece is in C minor doesn't mean you're not going to hit all the other keys when you're talking about Beethoven. So, you know, one of the things um, 
I, sometimes people ask me, they say, you know, why Beethoven? Why, why do we consider him to be such a gr one of the greats? And, um, and I, I like to say that his music has been filtered through time. I mean, there were, obviously there were an awful lot of composers who were writing around the same time period. And, and we play his music. We play Mozart. We play Haydn. We, you know, it's not that other composers are not worthy of being played as well, but there is something about his music that speaks so deeply to the human condition that it transcends, you know, 250 years that, um, that it still speaks really deeply to the human condition. Um, even after we've played or heard Prokofiev and Roth or, I mean, and the Beatles and I mean, you know, everything that, that has happened in, in popular music, it still speaks so deeply to us. Is there anything in particular that speaks that, of his music that speaks that way to you? I think, um, you know, for me, what stands out about classics, any kind of classics, whether it's classical music or classical literature or even like classic pop music is that you can listen to it at different points in your life or, you know, different people with different levels of understanding of the art form can listen to it and get something out of it. You know, you can understand it on so many different levels and it always can give something back. And I think for, you know, all the classical music we, we love and play, you know, especially Beethoven, even if you don't know anything about music, you hear that opening of the Fifth Symphony, you know, you can't help but be captivated by it. And, you know, if you know music a little bit, you know how great it is, you know what to expect, but you, you can still hear new things every time you hear it. Um, and then we go further. If you're a theorist, you understand it. There's so many things in there. If you're a performer, you understand, you know, if you play the violin, you know the parts. If you know, if you're conducting, you, it's, it's just so many ways to appreciate it. And I think that's what makes any kind of enduring art form endure because um, it's not just you hear it once and you go, okay, I get it. And, you know, hear it again. Well, that, you know, there's nothing more I need to get from it. This Beethoven, you can listen over and over again, especially when you listen to different people play it. That's my, my, kind of my favorite thing is to find recordings that I've not heard before and listen to it. And so you, I'm surprised sometimes I'm like, oh, I've never heard that played that way or never heard this rhythm brought out this way. And, um, you know, as a performer, I, that, that's what I, I don't, I don't like everyone's performance of every piece, but, but there's something that I can gain listening to them, whether it's you know, something I like or something I, I know that I don't like, so I won't do it that way. But um, there's always something to, to explore there. So yeah, that's, Absolutely. that's why I like uh, classical music. <laughs> Uh, we are, we're just about out of time, Sean, and, but let me just ask one, one kind of final question because obviously, you know, we're all, we're still in the midst of a pandemic. We're coming off of, um, you know, it had been half a year of hiatus where we weren't performing. I, I suppose as a, as a solo pianist, you might have been doing more of, I know you were doing some digital things. What does it mean to you to be, uh, to be out, to be performing live for an audience right now? Oh, it's wonderful. I, I think one of the hardest things with this transition was doing the digital stuff because I'm just at my home with the camera and you don't have the audience, you don't have the hall, you don't have, I mean, I love playing with, with orchestra, I love playing concertos because it's like, you, you there's, there's really nothing actually like, you know, playing, it being on stage and having this, the, the music from the symphony, the sounds from the orchestra, you know, kind of swallowing you up um, and, and collaborating with all the musicians to make something happen is, is a lot of a lot of fun. It's really exhilarating, and you don't get that um, when you. I mean, I love playing solo too, but it's not the same thing, and it's definitely not the same thing playing by yourself in front of a camera. So, uh, I'm really excited to be to be playing live, to see people in the audience. You know, trying to do our best to be safe uh, as well, but but I think we can make that happen and also bring live music. Um, and live collaborative music to you. So I'm really, really excited to be doing this. Well, Jean, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me for this, uh, this uh, Behind the Baton, this, this pre-concert talk that will go out to our digital uh, subscribers. And uh, I'm so glad that, that we're gonna be working together. And uh, I, I can't wait for this concert on Saturday night. I know it's gonna be a, a spectacular one. 
And so thanks for joining me right now for Behind the Baton. Thanks for having me.